Hey, greetings, everyone. Lieutenant Colonel Alan West here, the Executive Director of the American Constitutional Rights Union, and welcome to another episode of Live Free TV. And I hope you like the new format. We've got a new producer for this program, and I think that we are going to just take this to a new level. You know, normally we have someone that I will have the opportunity to interview, but I just thought that I would share some thoughts, perspectives, and insights with you about where we are in the United States of America. There's some very disturbing things that are happening. And I think many of you saw what was quite shocking, if you put it that way, in Dearborn, Michigan, not too long ago. Can you please roll the video clip? The Africa! You know, here in the United States of America, and understand that on 31 July 1982, I took an oath to support and defend the Constitution in the United States of America against all enemies, foreign and domestic, to bear true faith and allegiance to the same. I took that obligation freely without any purpose of evasion or mental reservation. And I said, so help me God. And I understand in the United States Constitution that we have individual rights, individual rights, freedoms, and liberties. They're enshrined in the first 10 amendments of our Constitution called the Bill of Rights. And in the First Amendment, you have the freedom of speech, freedom of expression. But what you just saw, I don't think it's about living free. I don't think it's about the freedom of speech and freedom of expression. If you had seen the entire clip, someone that is saying that our system of governance here is corrupt and has to be destroyed, has to be replaced. And then a gentleman shouted, death to America. See, what we are facing in the United States of America is really sedition. It is really about a threat to the way of life that we have come to enjoy. And so here are individuals in the United States of America that are advocating. Now, they have the right to do so, I guess, but they are advocating for a designated, a known terrorist organization, Hamas that on October the 7th of last year killed Americans, took Americans hostage. Maybe those hostages are no longer alive. But yet we're supposed to believe that there is no accountability for a terrorist organization, that they're supposed to be able to go and cross the border of a sovereign nation and kill innocent men, women, and children because of why? Well, understand that the charter of Hamas, this terrorist organization, clearly states that they exist to basically eradicate, exterminate, and eliminate the Jewish nation and the Jewish people. When you hear people say from the river to the sea, well, they're talking about the genocide of the Jewish people. And furthermore, when they continue to talk about this word called Palestine, let's have the mm -hmm. honest conversation here right now on Live Free TV. This is a region. But Yasser Arafat and, and those people back in that early age, the 50s and the 60s, and definitely it elevated into the 70s, they were very adept at taking a word which defined a region and tying it to a people. To try to advocate for them to have something that has never existed. And so, first of all, let's understand where the word Palestine came from. Again. If we're to live free, we have to understand truth. And remember what George Orwell once said, that in a universe of deceit, telling the truth is a revolutionary act. So let's commit a revolutionary act right here. Go back to 132 to 135 AD. Some people call it the second Jewish insurrection, re revolution, the Simon Bar Kokhba revolt against the Roman Empire. And in that revolt from 132 to 135 AD, initially the Jewish insurrectionists, if you want to call them that, the Jewish revolutionaries, they were very successful against the occupying Roman force. The Roman emperor at the time was Emperor Hadrian. But as you know, all things with Rome, they were not going to allow some small little province in some distant area in what we call the Middle East today to stand up to the power of Rome, because if they were 
successful in doing so, why wouldn't other provinces, why wouldn't other parts of the empire rise up against them? So the Romans decided to crush the Jewish people. And Emperor Hadrian laid out a couple of decrees after they crushed the Simon Bar Kokhbar revolt. Number one, the name of the Jewish capital, Jerusalem, was changed to Aeolia Capitolina. The other decree that Emperor Hadrian set down was Judea would no longer be called Judea. It would be called Syriac Palestina. S Y R I A C. P-A-L-A-E-S-T-I-N-I-A, Palestinia. Now, what is the root word? Why did this Palestinia work? Where did that come from? Well, it is the derivative of the word Philistia. Yeah, the old Philistines who lived in a place called Gaza. Remember, you know, David and Goliath, you know, that story from our days in Sunday school. But who are the Philistines? Who are they tied to? Well, they were not indigenous to the region. They could be traced back to ancient Greece. So in history and in time, it was known as this region, Palestine. But really, it was all based upon a punishment to the Jewish people for rising up against the Roman Empire. There was another name that that region was also called, and that was the Levant. There were sea merchants, Italian, French sea merchants. We travel across the Mediterranean, and Levant means rises from the sea, because if you've ever been there in Tel Aviv or along the coast there in the Mediterranean in Israel, it looks as though the mountains rise from the sea as you're approaching. But we then, for whatever reason, call people Levantinians, although ISIS did, you know, once upon a time call itself ISIL, the Islamic State in the Levant. But again, it's a region. So you fast forward until the 20th century where you have some very astute people, Grand Mufti of Jerusalem, Yasser Arafat, many others, who decided they would tie the name of a region to just Arab people to try to do exactly what Emperor Hadrian had attempted to do years ago. And also a guy by the name of Adolf Hitler tried to do it, to eradicate, eliminate, and not have the establishment of a Jewish state in the Middle East, a Jewish state that had existed now, today, for some nearly 5,800 years. And, and I would just say to these people that think that there is this nation called Palestine, can you show me where there was a king of Palestine, queen of Palestine, duke, duchess, something? I mean, can you show me some governmental authority? Can you show me some, you know, historical boundaries and borders? Can you show me some separate culture? Can you show me some language? Can you show me some monetary commodity, financial system? No, you can't. So what people are upset about and these terrorist organizations, Islamic terrorist organizations have been founded upon is something that has never existed. But yet the end goal is to destroy a nation that has existed. And when you talk about a two-state solution, I mean, you go back to 1947, the two-state solution was Israel and Jordan, but that was just unacceptable to people because they did not want to see the existence of a Jewish state. So now how is it that all of a sudden a terrorist organization, and oh, by the way, let's be very honest, Iran, the number one state sponsor of Islamic terrorism, the United States of America has been here before. 40 years ago, October the 23rd of 1983, another one of these affiliates of Iran, Hezbollah, truck bombing, Beirut barracks, 234 Marines, sailors, soldiers lost their lives. So for us to believe that we are not also a target of this enemy and this adversary, it's absolutely absurd. absurd. It's quite delusional when you think about it. But how do we get to the point where we would say that people that are supporting a terrorist organization that has the blood of Americans on their hands? I mean, it's pretty funny to me when you see people going up to Capitol Hill and they have this fake blood on their hands and they're trying to say that you support Israel who has blood on their hands, but yet the genocidal people of Hamas, Hezbollah, Islamic Jihad, Al-Quds, Al-Aqsa, Martyrs Brigade, they're the ones that have the blow on their hands. But why are they siding with them? 
I mean, I guess you have the, the choice to do so. But is it logical? And I think it undermines the safety and security of the United States of America. It is not a constitutional right to stand up and publicly say that you want to see this system of governance to be destroyed. And we need to be able to talk about that. It is not a constitutional right to go out and publicly say that you support an organization that has killed Americans. Because last time I checked, <laughs> that was a felony offense to provide material support and comfort to the enemy. Let me give you a case in point. I mean, you know, after the bombing of Pearl Harbor, if people were running around waving the flag of Imperial Japan, would we have said, okie dokie, blocking bridges, disrupting Christmas ceremonies in New York City? If after 9-11, if people were out waving around the flag of Al-Qaeda and celebrating and cheering on Al-Qaeda and what they had done, 3,000 Americans lost their lives, what would we have said or done? I mean, when we are still going out and arresting people that are showing allegiance to ISIS. So why are we allowing people that are showing allegiance to this Islamic terrorist organization to be able to chant, chant death to America. I think it's because there are some people that see Israel more of an enemy than they do the Islamic terrorist organization, Hamas or Hezbollah, or even Iran. And to me, that is, once again, kind of deranged because if it is Israel, their target, who do you think is the next target? And really, the end goal target is Western civilization. And I'm not making this up. I'm just reading what these terrorists have said. And after all, I've been on the ground in that part of the world, and I've been on the receiving end of some sympathies and love from terrorist organizations by way of an AK-47, an RPG, or PKM. When Osama bin Laden's henchmen of 9-11 flew those airplanes into the World Trade Center and uh, to the Pentagon, and of course, the one that crashed in the fields of Shanksville, Pennsylvania, they did not ask people, are you a Republican or Democrat? They did not ask people, do you like Israel or not? They just knew they wanted to kill Americans. Just the same as when Hamas came in and attacked that peace promoting music festival that young people were attending. They didn't ask them if they wanted peace with Hamas. They just killed them because they were Jews. And again, when I hear this whole thing about occupying, well, the state of Israel has been out of Gaza since 2005. And which governing authority came in and took over Gaza? A terrorist organization that has in its charter the extermination, elimination, and eradication of the Jewish people in the Jewish state. And so when you hear people chant from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. Free of what? Because you're talking about a region. It's not about a people. It's not about a nation that's never existed. So the hard conversation that we need to start having here in the United States of America is that will our policies be dictated by individuals that are guilty of a felony offense of supporting, providing material support and comfort to a terrorist organization, aiding and abetting. When you have members of the United States House of Representatives that are spewing forth propaganda that emanates from an Islamic terrorist organization, and who am I talking about? I think we know Cory Bush, representative from Missouri. Rashida Tlaib, the representative from Dearborn, Michigan. Jamal Bowman, representative from New York. And a few others. There, if I'm correct, took an oath to the Constitution of the United States of America, but yet they're supporting an organization that, and people that just said there that our very system of governance, governance mm -hmm. needs to be destroyed. <laughs> and replaced by what? And now we understand that 
there are people that are saying that unless Joe Biden changes his policy toward Israel, they're not going to be supporting him in the upcoming presidential election. That's political extortion. So in other words, support an Islamic terrorist organization that attacked a sovereign nation state, which, by the way, just happens to be our best ally in that region, or you're not going to get our vote. Now, let's just go back and look at what happened this past weekend over Israel's skies at night. Those sounds that you hear of the sounds of the Iron Dome, David's sling, the arrow weapon systems and other type of systems that were intercepting these rockets, missiles, ballistic missiles and drones, some 350 some odd. Some of them did fail but before they reached their destination, but they were shot down. Just think about this. The Biden administration inherited uh, Iranian policy where Iran was basically bankrupt. They had less than $5 billion of cash reserves. That, your country is basically bankrupt if you got less than $5 billion of cash reserves. Even though in a previous administration to the Trump administration, the Obama administration, we remember the pallets of laundered cash in an unmarked airplane that flew into Iran in the middle of the night. And there are some estimates that anywhere from 20 to 60 billion dollars have flown from flowed from the Biden administration to the Islamic Republic of Iran, the number one state sponsor of Islamic terrorism. But also think about the fact that during this current administration, the policies have been to ease on the uh, sanctions on their oil and gas industry. So then now they're freely selling, and the number one customer for Iran is China. And so in other words, what you just witnessed, the amount of military capability, capacity, capacity, weaponry that was able to be fired against Israel, the support to Hamas, Hezbollah, Islamic Jihad, these other terrorist organizations. This is all because we have enriched the coffers of the number one state sponsor of Islamic terrorism. And furthermore, it was about two, maybe three weeks ago in the United Nations, where they brought up a resolution in the Security Council to force Israel into a ceasefire, which, of course, you know, I don't think they paid attention to. But the United States of America decided to abstain from that vote. They didn't vote yes, didn't vote no. They abstained. But the message was very clear that if you say that you're going to support someone, you support them in what they're seeking to do. You don't tell them that, oh, you know, you have to have a proportional response. Oh, you know, that's enough. You need to back off. We we need to, you know, ease up on them. Why would you ease up on a terrorist organization? Uh, After 9-11, did anyone tell us to ease up on Al-Qaeda or the Taliban? Did anyone tell us to ease up on ISIS? No. And so now, after that attack that we just witnessed and we've seen on the news reports and what have you, the Israeli people and Israeli leadership is told to take that as a win. I don't take it as a win if someone drives by my house and I know the person that drew by, drove by my house and they shoot up my house. But yet when I try to report it to the police, the police say, hey, it's no big deal. Don't press charges. Just take it as a win. because." Nobody inside your house was hurt. Still, the fact that someone would brazenly, someone that I know, would brazenly drive past my house and conduct a drive-by shooting, and you're going to tell me not to do anything about it, not to retaliate, and to take that as a victory? I'm sorry. I don't see that as a victory. I see that as the result of 
compromise, appeasement, acquiescence, and attempt to negotiate. Remember, the Biden administration has tried to revive the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, better known as the Iranian Nuclear Agreement. See, we can't live free in the United States of America by appeasing and accommodating Islamic terrorist organizations. We cannot live free in the United States of America by appeasing and accommodating the number one sponsor of Islamic terrorism in the world. We cannot live free in the United States of America by appeasing and accommodating our number one geopolitical foe, which is China. I guarantee you China knew exactly what Iran was going to do. After all, they're their number one customer for oil and gas. Just the same as I'm sure Xi Jinping knew exactly what Russia was going to do in going in and invading Ukraine. Something that began during the Obama administration. And of course, the Obama administration sent socks and MREs. It didn't happen during the Trump administration. See, in that part of the world, and I speak from experience. People understand two things. That's strength and might. And if we are to live free, we need to have individuals that understand that our sovereignty has to be protected. Why would you have an open borders policy at a time when you have emboldened, encouraged, and enriched the number one sponsor of Islamic terrorism? I mean, we just found out that there was an Afghan individual that was a member of an Islamic terrorist organization that had been released twice from custody. We know that there are 1.5 to 2 million Gataways, people that we don't know who they are or where they are in the United States of America. We know that some 35 to 40,000 single military age male Chinese have been released into this country. But yet, we just recently had a federal judge in Illinois say that illegal immigrants have a right to the Second Amendment. But yet, if you listen to the State of the Union address, the president of the United States of America, who is supposed to uphold the laws of this nation, Second Amendment is part of our Constitution. That's an individual right. It's endowed to us. But yet he believes that legal law abiding citizens should not have the Second Amendment. At the same time, when we have individuals that are on our streets shouting death to America. Can't live free. We have individuals that are not doing what the Constitution directs them to do, but instead advancing yeah. an ideological agenda which is the antithesis to who we are as a constitutional republic. So now you're saying, well, Colonel, what should we do? If you are supporting an Islamic terrorist organization in the United States of America that has killed Americans, potentially still holding Americans hostage, you're aiding and abetting and providing material support and comfort to the enemy. That's not freedom of speech. That's not freedom of expression. You cannot live freely in the United States of America and talk about undermining and destroying our system of governance. That's sedition. That's treason. If you are a citizen, there are laws that apply to you. If you are not a citizen, well, you should not be in the United States of America. If you are blocking traffic in the United States of America, as we saw at the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco this past weekend, then you should be charged with aiding and abetting providing material support and comfort to a terrorist organization, because that's what you're doing. Not to mention you're disrupting and preventing the free maneuver of American citizens, basically holding them hostage to your support of a terrorist organization that wants to see something implemented and established that has never existed in the history of the world. But really, if we're to live free, it's, start, it's time we start demanding more of our elected okay. officials to own up to the oath that they took to the Constitution of the United States of America, not trying to balkanize us, not trying to you know, separate and divide and conquer us. And furthermore, it's time for us to have these hard conversations with our young people who, for whatever reason, believe that if they were at that concert in Israel, they think that they would have been spared. 
it is befuddling to me what I see happening. And it is not under the guise of us living free. It's under the guise of us being held hostage, even here in our United States of America. Never forget the reason why we have to take off our shoes. We can't have a bottle of water or anything. Our loved ones can't see us off at the airport gates anymore. Because that's what terrorism does. Terrorism changes your way of life. And right now, we're allowing that to happen. And I think those of us here in the United States of America need to say no more. Because living free means being free to live. God bless you all. We'll see you next time on the next episode of Live Free TV.